Okay, so welcome everybody to this uh, open forum. Um, I'll be introducing the panel uh, in a moment. Uh, just some basic uh, rules and the aims of this. This is very much an open forum, no particular topic. I've left it that way because um, I didn't want to guide a conversation to an area that didn't meet the concerns and questions that many of you might have. I'll introduce the panel now. First of all, we've got uh, Major General uh, Sharon Nesmith. Uh, Sharon, Sharon was the first woman to command a British Army Brigade, and she's now the most senior woman in the Army, as well as the first serving woman to sit on the Executive Committee of the Army Board. Um, the Army, uh, what we got here, uh, the Times reported that uh, Sharon was to be appointed as Director of Personnel at Army Headquarters and will sit on the Army Board. Then we have um, Joe Hay. Joe Hay um, is uh, Chief Executive, uh, CEO of FDS, Director Services and Onboarding Officers with 30 years of corporate finance experience and winner of numerous awards, including the Sunday Times Non-Executive Director of the Year, CBI First Woman in Business Award and the IOD Yorkshire Non-Executive Director of the Year. Paul Trudhill, Senior Partner at Keebles. He's experienced in mergers and acquisitions, transactions, particularly in the manufacturing sector. He was named Corporate Lawyer of the Year in 2014 at the South Yorkshire Insider Dealmakers Awards and acts for SMEs, banks and other financial institutions. Nick Barron, partner at Equius International, where he supports clients and predominantly in the industrial sector. Served as an infantry officer until he left the army in 1996. He then joined the recruitment industry where he has had a diverse career working for a number of UK's leading firms. James Sunderland, He's a uh, James Sunderland Member of Parliament, MP, a uh, member of the Conservative Party. He serves as a member of the Parliament for Bracknell since 2019. He was commissioned into the British Army from the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst and served for 26 years as a regular officer. Regular service consists of continuous regimental duty and staff appointments from second lieutenant to colonel. Alex Spofforth. Uh, Alex is Managing Director of his firm of Chartered Accountant accountant Spotforth Partners Limited. He's over 36 years experience with finance. He is chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Officers Association and company secretary to Project Hougamont, the site of the Battle of the Waterloo. Myself, Lee Holloway, I'm the Chief Executive, Executive Officer of the Officers Association. I'm also Vice Chair of, of COBSIO, Confederation of Service Charities, and Board Member of the Lady Grover uh, Fund. I have 20 years service in the Royal Navy, and 20 years service in the, in the aerospace, sec, aerospace sector, uh, 12 of those years at board level. I don't want to repeat the obvious. We know the economy has been severely damaged. Companies have severely, at least in most se sectors, curtailed or suspended hiring. Many people have lost their jobs or, uh, or their jobs are at risk and, also, and um, they've been, or they've been furloughed, furloughed, sorry. And some companies may, may not survive. And we all know this, and we're constantly reminded of the, uh, by the media of the negative aspects. However, I'd like to start with a, what I think is a, a reasonable analysis of some, some fundamental qualities industries will need, not only to survive, but to be in a position to move on and re-establish sustainability and growth. And which in my opinion, align with the capabilities of veterans and specifically officers can bring to, to, to these businesses. Now, these aren't necessarily my own words, I've, I've read as much as possible, but um, one of the most informative um, companies and opinions I found are actually Deloitte's. And Deloitte have broken the crisis down into three phases. Phase one is a response. The response is the way in which a company deals with the present situation and manages continuity. Phase two is recover, the period during which a company learns and emerges stronger. And phase three is thrive. That's where the company prepares for and shapes the next normal. Now, there are at least four fundamental qualities uh, any organization's leadership must have in order to effectively implement these phases. They must put the mission first. Now, what does that mean? They must be skilled at triage, have the ability to stabilize their organization, organizations to meet the crisis at hand while, while finding opportunities and overcoming difficult restraints. They must aim for speed and diligence, uh, speed over elegance. Resilience, resilient leaders take decisive action. 
with courage based on imperfect information, knowing, what, knowing that expedience is essential. They should own the narrative. Resilient leaders see the narrative at the outset, being transparent about current realities, including what they don't know, while painting a compelling picture of the future that inspires others to persevere. And finally, they should embrace the long view. Resilient leadership stays focused on the horizon, anticipating the new business models that, they're like, that are likely to emerge and sparking innovations that will define tomorrow. Now, when I read this, all of the qualities that I've just described are instilled in every officer and every phase of officers training that I've experienced, and for that matter, non-commissioned officers as well. I, be I believe it's the core to the OA's mission to bring these qualities to the attention of business and society in general, and hopefully to the benefit of all those who take advantage of our services. So I'd like to open up to questions uh, to um, all those attendees. If you use the raise your hand button on the participants um, section of Teams, as your hand comes up, I'll call you in to ask a question. I do have pre-prepared questions if some of you would like time to think. So I'll just give you a second to look at that, see if anything comes up. So one of the first questions uh, we had was, um, how does the panel see the current COVID environment and its subsequent effect on the global economy impacting on the future job market here in the UK? So um, I think, Alex, if I could ask you first, please, because you are getting an awful lot of of a lot of business from companies who are finding themselves in a unique situation and giving them advice on how they might deal with this. So can I ask you to comment on that one? Yes, thank you, Lee, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I guess I'm seeing a lot of the impact on this, the SME market, uh, some businesses which are already unfortunately failing. Um, but also, of course, these SMEs are the major supply line for large companies. So we're seeing the larger companies getting a bit concerned that their contractors are not going to be there. But rather than being doom and gloom about that, I think the opportunity we're seeing is the need for good consultancy, for good experience, if you like, to come to the fore. So whereas knowledge and experience was in the boardrooms of corporates, I can see that that might well shift to independent consultants, business advisors, people who have experience from your area of, of military, who are then able to sell that experience through to businesses in a nimble way, in an agile way. I think the larger companies are likely to shed some of that in-house experience as they need to cut some of their overhead. And they will need, therefore, to go to people like you, who may have a portfolio career in the offing uh, in advising corporates in that way. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Joe, you have uh, you raised your hand, so you want to say something there. Um, so, um, as you may know, Lee, my background is very much in the SME sector, principally owner-managed businesses, and I feel very passionate about that sector. And I think there will be huge opportunities for the military officers who can have a huge impact on their uh, future performance because. Um, like Alex said, a lot of these companies have gone into meltdown and what they have been lacking is any crisis management skills at all. They've started to panic like mad. Whilst there is funding, a lot of it's going to have to be paid back. But I believe that the SME sector is the backbone of Britain and they will have to come back because that's the way they earn their living. So they're going to have to fight tooth and nail to survive and they will. But if we could get some great officers on those boards and into the executive teams, they'll perform better, quicker. And how do you think that um, the industries are going to deal with going from a hard stop, where they are now, a lot of them anyway, to uh, when, when things pick up again um, and the brakes are off to suddenly starting business and find they've, they've got stuff on furlough, they've let stuff go or they're, um, basically, the, you know, they need to get going. They need to be ramping up for business when it opens up rather than going from a cold start. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people have found other ways of working. They've had to because it's the only way to get paid. These guys and girls don't get a salary every month. So they've had to find other innovative ways of working. Um, it's keeping going on that. And one of the things I think that the offices can bring is a sense of calm and a sense of purpose and a, a 
and support. And that's what they need. Owner managers are actually quite vulnerable. We all put on a very brave face, but underneath it, you know, we, we've got a very thin veneer. And if we could get support from people who've seen crises like this and more, I think that would be an amazing, amazing difference to British industry. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Sharon, you've raised your hand. Yes, thanks, Lee. I was just going to come in in support of what Joe was saying there about what I think uh, officers, our non-commissioned officers, have to contribute to a company that perhaps is looking at a, a slightly stressful future. Um, and uh, not everyone might, might agree with this, but I think just to see the CDS on the television yesterday evening, uh, I think that landed uh, in it provided sort of a very reassuring sense of calm and control over a, an extraordinarily complex logistical position. Uh, so I think if I was to translate that to what I believe we can offer companies at the point that we decide to leave the service is that sense of confidence and reassurance in ability to deal with the complexity, a very clear sense of purpose and the ability to do some planning around that. Uh, particularly if you have a logistical background, I think your knowledge, skills and experience is uh, you know, worth its weight in gold. Uh, thank you. One of, the, one of the things that the OA want to do is, is promote and to um, increase the awareness, although there's a lot of it currently out there, increase the awareness of the capability of officers in general, in that a lot of the work being done to help society is being done through asking officers and veterans in general to step outside their established skill set, almost step outside their, their comfort zone. And that itself, that soft skill itself, can be quite valuable. Um, not everybody building a hospital or any other facility is a, a logistician. Many, it could be an ordinary uh, infantryman or in naval terms, you know, a, a seaman, a seaman officer with no particular skill set beyond that of organisation and leadership skills. Would you agree? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, of course, part of the KSE, the knowledge, skills and experience that I think uh, officers uh, across the services bring is the ability to delete, to work outside our comfort zone. I mean, so much of our training and education is about being comfortable with discomfort. Uh, and of course, there's nothing more uncomfortable than the economic uh, situation at the moment. So I think just that is, that's part of our DNA. Uh, and I think it is about selling that and explaining that uh, as an offer to future employers. Okay, I'll, I'll just let um, Joe get in and I'll, I'm gonna switch to Nick and, to, and James Sunderland. Uh, yes, Joe, you've got your hand raised. Okay, so, um, so just to say, while this is, a, a terrible world experience. Actually, it's a huge opportunity for officers to show what they can do. Um, I sit on seven boards as chair. Only one of them had a worldwide pandemic on their risk register. Uh, they had it as low likelihood, but high impact. And they make aero parts. So obviously their business was going to be hugely affected. Within three days, they were up and running, making ventilators, and were the first company in the country to get the C-bill loan. They haven't furloughed a single person. That business is owned by an ex-military. Okay, good, good point. Um, I'd like to switch to, uh, to, to, to James and to, to Nick now. Um, which sectors, if at all, do you see emerging from this crisis uh, first, if there, if there is going to be a first, do you think some are going to be rather more ahead than others? Can I ask you, James? Yeah, good afternoon. It's a tough question to answer because uh, clearly I, I can speak with some confidence on the political situation right now. And, and of course, the issue I've got is that no one knows what the future is going to hold. Um, what I will say to you via this forum is that the single biggest issue that's uh, affecting the cabinet right now, uh, it's this dichotomy between economy and getting it back up and running 
and also of course duty of care for the individual um, and, and the cabinet is split completely 50-50 on that. Um, so my personal feeling is that uh, in terms of what gets back to normal first, I think the answer is twofold. Firstly, it's a question of what businesses are able to function in terms of lifting the restrictions. Uh, and I think it's also a case of which businesses are the most agile in terms of management leadership, in terms of being able to work out what they need to do to regain that vital ground of profitability and to go for it. Thank you very much. What about you, Nick? Do you have an opinion on this? As yes, a... I, I, I do. And, and good afternoon. Um, I, I think in some ways it's, it's easy to, to look at the um, industries which are going to struggle um and um take a, a a long time to recover if at all but i think that the, the ones that probably will will lead the way if i can pick out a few um i, I think financial services historically um ha, has been one of our most agile industries um and, and i suspect that a, a large part of the financial services sector um will will bounce back quite quickly um, although um, insurance um, as a sector, I, I, I think is going to um, deal with the, uh, the, the, the fallout of the current crisis for obvious reasons for, for, for a long time to come. Uh, but I think the ongoing change within financial services, um, the, the um, impact of new fintech and so on and so forth will, will bounce back um, really, really quite quickly. Um, I think another sector um, which uh, will we'll, um, again recover quite quickly is, is that of um, infrastructure um, and I'm, I'm talking about large engineering projects um, and James may, may or, or may not have, have more insight into this but, but my sense is that the government that we, we, we currently have um, has already pitched itself uh, quite hard as, as a, a government that's going to in, invest in infrastructure, going to address um, issues like the Northern Powerhouse and um, I, I think that investing um, in some of those projects will be a way of um, constructively injecting um, cash into the, uh, the, the economy that will help to, to get um, the, the industry, uh, well, sorry, the um, industry running again. So, so that's there. Um, I think the other sector um, which is um, one, one to watch is energy um, and I think there are some paradoxes here um, I, I know we may discuss the oil price later on, uh, but obviously there's a, a, a big drive um, in the green, um, the, the, the green economy. Um, I think the oil price um, problem that we have creates a, a, a paradox where on, on one hand it um, drives the, uh, the, the energy majors to want to and increase their efforts to diversify, but it takes away some of the capital um, that they might have to uh, to, to do it. Um, so those of them that can raise um, finance elsewhere um, because they have the, the, the scale and the infrastructure to do it in the, the, the low um, interest rate economy, I think will will continue to do that um, and others others may struggle. Um, and then the, the other sector is um, is the healthcare sector, which clearly is 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 having a, an investment financially and in all in all areas and and i think that will uh, will will only continue uh, across both the, the the public and uh, and private sectors thank you thank you nick um uh, james you've got your hand raised did you want to come in yeah very quickly i think that uh, if you go back to the uh, chancellor's budget um about five six weeks ago now um it seems an eternity ago but uh, that was a generous budget and by modern spending um standards it was pretty unprecedented uh, and clearly what we've had is a, a decade of austerity where, um, where, where the government has needed to put money aside and that's what's been happening. Um, and I think it's a real shame now that uh, here we are with the country coming out of austerity with some ambitious spending plans from the government and this COVID-19 thing turns up and upsets the apple cart. So what am I saying? Well, I think the first thing is that um, you know, the country is £1.7 trillion in debt at the moment. And, um, you know, the budget was quite generous in my view with that in mind. Because we're now going to be currently half a trillion pounds in, perhaps rising to £1 trillion in terms of further government debt on the back of COVID-19, I think there will have to be some recalibration in terms of those spending plans that have already been announced. So it's not for me to comment in terms of government, but certainly HS2 is up there. Um, there are some ambitious spending plans with capital equipment, 
with the MOD, um, there are other things which no doubt will have to receive a review. So I think at the moment all bets are off in terms of government spending. Thanks, thanks very much, James. Now I'm getting messages from three different directions here, so I've got some texts as well. Um, I have a question for, I think, uh, Sharon, um, this one. So I'm going to read it uh, verbatim if I can find it again. Um, so um, it, the question is, uh, it says, uh, I have not yet submitted any uh, my notice and with 12 months notice period to serve after submission, entering the civilian job market seems a long way off. Uh, she wants to know if she, we, she, we, we recommend interviews. Um, I think that there are two parts to that question actually. Um, yes, I would recommend um, that not so much interviews, but I think I think you should take part in um, as much networking as possible. It's difficult at the moment, but you must be prepared to to take part in any networking events as we come out of um, out of COVID nineteen and whatever you know whatever decisions the government makes, we'll have to follow. Obviously, um, Sharon, on, with that, um, is. And I'm not asking for MOD policy. I understand you can't say MOD policy. That's not what you do. Uh, but are the Ministry of Defence encouraging people to currently stop putting in notice, stop leaving, or are they being asked to volunteer to extend? Or are, are in some cases they're being ordered to extend? Uh, to what degree is the Ministry of Defence trying to retain people, if at all? Uh, Lee, thank you. Uh, so it's a really timely question. Uh, I mean, one of the very first things we did at the start of uh, really understanding what COVID was going to mean to um, the nation, uh, our priority was around looking after our people and giving the opportunity for those that are in the pipeline on their way to leave, uh, the opportunity to change direction. Uh, and that was both for people that were coming to the end of their natural engagement uh, if people had put in a notice to terminate or a, um, a PVR, an opportunity for them to withdraw it. Um, so, so the folk, and, and actually for rejoiners, I should say as well. So there may well be uh, a number of service personnel that have recently left that of course have found themselves in an entirely different environment to that which they um, had planned. Uh, so we uh, have re-energized our rejoiners market we have reached out to those that we know that are, we're about to leave the services to encourage them to look at the options should they want to serve on. Uh, and it's absolutely through the lens of looking after people. Um, so uh, living in the spirit of that, it's not about telling people you cannot leave the service. Uh, it's really to make sure that we're giving people an opportunity to relook at their plans. Uh, thanks very much for that. Uh, if anybody wants to come in and ask a question on that, please, uh, please do ask. So, um, now let's let's have a look at some other questions we have. Um, there's one general here for um, again. I I think it is is for, for Nick um, and Joe Joe Haig probably. If there is a deep global recession as forecast by some economists, how do you see this affecting longer term employment opportunities for service leavers and veterans? Uh, can I ask uh, Nick first? Um. I, I think the first question is, or first part of that question is about the nature of um, the, the, the global recession. And at this stage, we just don't know um, how, how profound or, or, or otherwise it, it might be. And um, I'm trying to take a, a glass half full perspective on, on things at the moment, um, perhaps um, perhaps unwisely so. But um, my, my view is that the, the nature of the, the crisis that we're experiencing currently is, as I think um, Joe mentioned uh, earlier on and, and, and General Sharon referred to, is, is bringing um, the value of um, the, the skills of military leaders right to the, the, the forefront of um, the, the minds of um, businesses where, wherever they may be. And, and one of my experiences as I've talked to uh, businesses over the years about the, 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 the potential benefits of bringing um, military leaders into their organisations uh, ha, has been that they see the value of, of leadership and, and where that fits in. They see the, the value of um, organisational skills. The, the piece about resilience, yes, they value resilience, but they don't quite understand always the depth of military resilience. And, and yet, I think this crisis 
has um, created a, a, a much greater sense of that um, in, in businesses than, than we've seen certainly in, in my um, working lifetime. And, and I think will increase the, um, the, the, the value of the military skill set as, as we come um, through that recession and, and beyond. Thank you very much, Joe. Would you would you agree with that? Um, yes, I absolutely would. Uh, I mean, I think what will happen is it will be a surge of startups. Uh, there's some opportunities in, in in new business areas, and 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 in reference to some points uh, earlier about what would survive and what might thrive, anything in cybersecurity is going to go absolutely mega anything in health management, which was mentioned earlier, anybody to do with streaming and technology. And um, also, I think there might be some more work for you, Paul, as a lawyer, because I think there'll be a few divorces out there actually after this. Um, but I think um, those are the businesses that are going to really thrive in this new world. As cybersecurity, health management, there are probably lots of things that offices can add to that. But the other thing I think the businesses that will really survive are the ones that market like mad now mm. and become known. That is what happened in the Great Depression. The businesses that survived and thrived were those that continued to market as if there was no tomorrow. And that is very important. And in reference to the question on, on, on networking, and Lee was saying, you know, it's quite difficult to network. It is not as difficult to network as you might think because we have all these wonderful platforms, LinkedIn, Twitter, WhatsApp, all sorts of things. What you need to do is you need to find a voice. You need to find what you are expert in and become the voice of authority on that. So that when people are looking at these sites and there's a lot, lot more traffic on those sites now, you need to start blogging about what you can do, find your expertise and then become that recognized voice in that. And then people will contact you. You don't need to go out and drink the champagne yet. You don't need to go out to actual physical networking events because you can't, but that doesn't mean you can't network. Thank you very much, Joe. I'm going to switch to, to, to Paul. I've got a, a question on the chat here. Um, now, what, um, this is Scott Allen. He says, uh, good afternoon, thanks for your time. Uh, we've mentioned a few sectors that we think may be at the forefront of bouncing back. What are, what are our thoughts on um, unemployment within the third, the charity-based sector? And what are the panel's thoughts on whether we could, would also be an area of, of, what would also be an area of growth for future careers? Do you have an opinion, Paul? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we act for a, a number of local and national charities here in Sheffield and what we are seeing, and I think you're probably aware of this already from the media, is that there is a huge amount of need within that third sector for financial support. So one particular charity that we have here in, in Sheffield makes grants of about 300,000 a year annually to local charitable projects and they have focused all of their uh, charitable donations this year to those charities which are particularly focused on COVID-19 issues. So that's things like food banks, that's uh, supporting mental health charities, those that are supporting particular parents and so on. So all the other projects that would otherwise have been involved, they would have been involved in, they've pushed back to later on the year or perhaps even to next year. So there is a, there's a real desperate need for finance and I can see, and certainly what we're getting from, from feedback through our charities, that if we're not careful, a lot of these charities will simply close and fall away. And as a consequence of that, inevitably, while there'll be a significant proportion of volunteers who are engaged in this, nevertheless, a number of charities do serve employees, and very sadly, those opportunities will go. Uh, a lot of the speakers have already talked about the skills which officers have and which they develop during their time in the services and certainly that ability to be able to drive through in organizations and to respond to challenges in a, a construct thought through way i think is really important particularly to charities because very often you'll find that in the third sector these organizations really spring up at any real necessarily experience of running an organization from a financial or organizational aspect and so i certainly think that there are significant opportunities for officers once we get a funding stream through for the third sector thanks thanks very much paul 
Um, a question actually I thought uh, of a few times as well, uh, and this, uh, uh, this is for James, I think. Um, while it, he says that uh, while we understand severity, um, the current of the situ current situation, the current estimate is the cost will last, the effect on the country, the cost will last about 25 years. So it takes 25 years to get over it. What does the panel say about how it's going to be repaid? Can we start with you, James? Yeah, I'm sure you're expecting this. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one, Lee. Uh, look, I think the bottom line is um, we, we don't know yet what the impact's going to be in terms of strategic and certainly in terms of the Treasury. Um, so clearly there'll be a period whereby the government will analyse um, where we are financially. I think the bottom line is that uh, we've proven in the past that we can pay back um, large debt. We did it after the Second World War. Um, you know, we, we, we had a, you know, a, a big debt before which we were clawing back um, during the sort of the Tory governments of the 2010-2019 era. Um, we'll claw it back again. And uh, I'm pretty clear that, uh, that this is not impossible. It's not insurmountable. It's just another crisis that we've faced historically. And the British people have got amazing resilience and spirit and we'll, we'll get through it. Um, but in terms of paying it back, um, I, I, I think that's going to be um, inevitable. I think we may have to see, heaven forbid, um, you know, tax go up. Um, you know, nothing comes free. And as generous as the government is right now, um, ultimately it's the taxpayer that's paying for it and uh, the taxpayer will wish to be reimbursed. Well, I must I congratulate you. The first politician I've heard say that taxes may go up. You won't be quoted. You're OK. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> no, I wouldn't dream of it. It's OK. Um, Alex, you have your hand up. Would you like, you'd like to make a point? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm quite happy to say, by the way, that taxes will go up. There are wealthy people in this country and people who will pay the, their taxes gladly to, to help people out. But one thing I think that we're coming back to a few times in this discussion is about what will happen not just immediately after this is over, but over a longer period of time. Now, business people don't tend to work with very long horizons. And what military training teaches you all is to watch that horizon very carefully. And you're very good at spotting changes in that horizon. So areas like risk assessments, business continuity planning, all of that good stuff tends to not be looked at by businesses in the good times. I was once in a company where the office burnt down and believe you me, once it had burnt down, we got our, our business continuity plan out and started looking at it again. Now is the time to do that medium to long term planning and military training really helps with the strategy of that. So if you've got those skills, sharpen them up and go and offer them to business because that is really needed. OK, thank you, Alex. Um, I've got a question from David Goodacre to all panellists, but I, I, I'll answer as well. It, he says, I'm due to leave the service in July voluntarily. However, all my resettlement has been cancelled and there are few job opportunities available at the moment. With the offer from the army to delay my departure, what would the panel think would be a sensible amount of time to delay? Well, that's quite a, uh, the answer would be subjective, I think, by, by anybody. Personally, I, if I could, if I was in your position and I was in the army right now and somebody gave me the opportunity just to put things off for 12 months, I would take it. 12 months would be about right. So I think six months probably we should see start to see coming out the end of this. Then you need six months to get uh, get your act together and start uh, start networking and start establishing yourself. Would any of the panel like to comment on that? Joe, you've got your hand raised, so you can go in. Uh, so I would agree. I think... Um... If you can take 12 months to plan what you want to do, and that could, as I say, be even thinking about starting your own business, uh, but it certainly could be using the time to think about where your skill set can be developed further. Maybe invest in some training and development, maybe read up on the things that you're interested in, see how you can hone your CV to make you more appealing. Now, I've talked about cybersecurity, for instance, if that's your field becoming an expert in a particular area give yourself that 12 months to do it so that when you do actually um, exit you will become a bit you will have become a bit more known okay that, i think that very much supports, supports what i think do any of the, the panel have anything to add to that i would like to ask sharon is there um when people are being 
either extended or they have a uh, resettlement council. Is it for a finite time or is it open-ended from an internal perspective? In other words, we'll stay as long as we need you or is there a set time period? Uh, so, so for officers, um, thankfully, the office, for officers, the, um, uh, the offer would be that they are able to go back onto the commission that they were previously on. So, uh, so however long is left on that is what the default position would be. Uh, clearly, they would then have to, if um, that didn't give long enough, uh, to then compete for different commission lengths. Uh, and of course, all of that, um, I mean, what I would say is basically reach out and have a two-way conversation about it because it's a very personal decision and personal dynamics around it. Because uh, it might be that you don't actually want to do it for that period of time. You might only want to do um, for 12 months. Mm -hmm. uh, but the intent from our perspective is that we'll find an offer that can work. Uh, and what we'd really like it to be is that you really pick up where you are at the moment, continue serving as you are now on the current in, um, commissional engagement. Um, one comment from uh, one of the attendees, and it's obviously a naval officer, I'm not sure how much you know naval wise, but um, uh, basically uh, this person was asked to, to, to remain, uh, but he was put or she was put into the general pot, is there such a thing? not into the role that that that, that person previously uh, left in so it's just that's just an observation and that actually meant that they decided by the way not to not to take the offer uh, lee it's a really a really valid point so uh whilst there's not very many of them there may be areas where structurally it's difficult for someone to come and re-engage uh but as i've just said the intent is to find an offer and even if it's not staying within current role, current cap badge, uh, the intent is to find something. Uh, but I think the preference would be that we're using the KSE that we have invested in, uh, and that would be to remain within current cap badge or role. Okay. Um, question for Joe uh, from from the from the chat. Um, what do you think this is a good time to consider consider starting a new business? Um, it's a bit like marriage or having a baby. There's never a good time. There's never a right time. You've got to really want this more than anything else. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I've decided because I know that there's going to be so much of this activity. I'm just halfway through a new book called The Entrepreneur's Guide to, um, to Setting Up Your Own Business. Because I think there's just going to be something that people will want to do. But the thing is, setting your own business up and then running it is nothing like getting a salary every month. It will feel entirely different. You will never, ever leave it. You'll never have a holiday again. You'll never leave your phone again. It is all encompassing, but it's a lovely thing to do if you find the right thing. And I don't regret a minute of doing it. But you need to find out what it is that you want to do and accept it will change your life forever. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just wonder generally, um, and I, I'm not deliberately looking at, at, at James for this, it's more, I think it's more an opinion, but I've personally, re reading uh, and looking at what goes on, I've got a feeling that the, the light will actually start to emerge around about the end of June. Does anybody have anything that they would like to, anyway, is there anybody would like to contradict that? And if so, why? Any of the panel? Nobody wants, everybody agrees with June. That's amazing. Um, what do we think, uh, when we couple COVID with Brexit, how do we think, is it a combination of factors that could, could affect the employment and the employment sector as a whole? Uh, does one, um, really encourage the other? Does, do, do both factors make it worse? I think they do, but are there any benefits to come out of Brexit and COVID-19 as dual events? Um, I, I actually think it will change the way people are being employed. I, I can't remember if it was um, Alex or James saying that I think there's going to be a surge of consultancy opportunities come out of this because I think there will be some people who don't want to commit to full-time staff but they still want to do whatever it is they want to do so I think there will be a, a definite move towards much more self-employment um, 
I also think because Brexit's going to happen no matter what happens now, whether, whether it's delayed or not, it's definitely, definitely going to happen, there will be opportunities. There'll be opportunities to develop new businesses that we were perhaps sourcing goods and services from internationally that in Europe that we don't want to do anymore or we can't do. So um, I, I'm not sure whoever was, else was saying that they're a glass half full person. I'm a glass over fulling, over filling person. There is no point being anything other than positive. We have to look forward positively on this. And I think it was James that said, the British are very resilient, very positive, and if anybody's going to get out of this, we are. I agree. I tend to be three quarters full as well. Um, luckily for me, my wife's glass half empty, so the balance is quite, is quite good. Um, I, Alex, you have a, a point you'd like to make here. Thank you. Just on, on the back of that, Joe, and I, I totally agree with you. I think we just have to be quite realistic about people in business. Military folk might not be the entrepreneurs who are going to invent things and make things, but by God, are they great as number two. And people in business are often very lonely. They have these brilliant ideas. They want to forge forwards. And a team of people is much more effective in a way of doing these things. I hope that the creative industries, the tech industries, those brilliant people who have gone through good education and learning at the coalface are given some kind of support. And I would hope that you guys listening today are the people working with them to work with their business plans, to look at that horizon and shape their future. But don't put yourself under huge pressure that you're the one man band approach. That's quite difficult unless you're in consultancy. We do need to make things again. Uh, there will, I think, be a lot of pressure to import goods and services from Europe. They're ready to flood the market in certain sectors. And if there are sectors which will suffer very badly, say as agriculture, horticulture, which are really on its knees now, the uh, European countries are going to be ready to start importing. So um, we have to be ready for all of that. But I would say, you know, find those creatives, find those entrepreneurs and work with them in those new startups. Thanks. Thank you very much. James, you have uh, a point you'd like to make? Yeah, uh, being a politician, I can't possibly pass up the opportunity of discussing Brexit. Um, but uh, what I would say really is twofold. I, I think that the future actually is about risk. And what I mean by that is that uh, businesses don't like uncertainty. Um, and at the moment, we have the double whammy, of course, of COVID-19 and Brexit. I mean, who'd be in business right now? In fact, who'd be in politics right now? So I think those business owners and those entrepreneurs who are happy to take risk, who are going to take a chance, I think the rewards are going to be there for them. Um, and just to refer back, if I may, to a previous question about whether the individual should stay in the army for a further 12 months. I spent 26 years uh, as a regular officer with the army trying to keep me in. And then, of course, when I became a parliamentary candidate, they couldn't wait to kick me out. Um, so what I would try and do, I think, is to, uh, you know, if you're naturally risk averse and in the army and the army is going to offer you an opportunity to stay in a bit longer, I'd probably take that. I had a great career. I love my time in the army and I'd do it all over again. Um, but I think it very much depends upon what and who you are as an individual in terms of then how you want to play it in the future. Thanks very much, James. And to follow up on that, I've got a question from Al Steele, which um, if I can go to, to Sharon for, I'll come to you in a moment, Joe, if I can, and I'll come to you, Paul, one moment. Um, uh, it says, uh, if we have recently left the military, but we haven't heard from the military, who should we be getting in touch with to discuss rejoining options? Um, that's for you, Sharon. Um, as a, an aside to this, when I met with Lieutenant General Nuji, um, I made it clear that the OA, the Office Association, was perfectly willing to act as the reverse funnel for anybody wanting to rejoin the, uh, the Army, Navy or the Air Force, uh, even the Royal Marines, um, and um, we would be that conduit uh, quite willingly. Um, so that's out there for all of you to acknowledge if you or know about. So Sharon, what do you think? Uh, thanks, Lee. So I, I, can't, I can't talk in detail about um, the other two services, but I think the principle will be the same. Uh, so in the first instance, um, you would be able to find uh, details on uh, the Army website. Uh, if you have very recently left 
I would encourage you to either get in contact with the regiment that you were serving with just at the point that you were leaving, or to contact your regimental headquarters, all of which will be able to uh, help you through the process. Of course, the other alternative would be um, to contact the APC, um, and I believe uh, that you, you will have those sorts of contact addresses um, either on the web page or indeed on your pay, um, your uh, last pay statement. Uh, the, uh, but, but Lee, thank you, because one of the things that I was going to offer is that if we could send you some of the linkage that following up on this or just more broadly, uh, anything to kind of smooth that uh, process would be really welcome, because actually one of our challenges has been to get the message out. Okay, well, so 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 you all know. Uh, so for all three branches uh, of, of the services, if you do have difficulty, Navy Army Air Force, please do come to us. Uh, I can get directly through to Naval Secretary um, Baz North. Uh, would I'm sure point me to the right direction for RAF personnel. So there's no shortage of of channels for us to use to point you in the right direction. Um, so I'm going to turn to to Paul, who's got a question anyway, um, but. As, as well as answering your question, Paul, um, and I'd like to, Alex to consider this as well. From Sean Taylor to all panelists, doesn't IR35 kill consultancy? In you come, Paul. Well, that's, uh, I wasn't expecting to be put on the spot quite like that. <laughs> 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 and that's really a question for an accountant rather than a lawyer, I think. I thought it might be a part of this without it. Neatly trying to swerve it. <laughs> I, I don't think it would kill it, certainly from a legal point of view. There is, there is always the ability for someone to provide their services at arm's length to a third party other than in circumstances where they're an employee. So from a legal point of view, I don't think it would kill it. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, there'll be some comments from, uh, from Alex on uh, uh, and from an accountancy point of view. The point I was going to make actually was in response to something that James said a short while ago in terms of businesses taking risk. It is absolutely right. All the businesses that prosper are the businesses that take risks, clearly. I think when, when we've spoken to our clients, and this is particularly in relation to Brexit, what they said was they want to make the, the most of the opportunities, but they don't really have opportunities are because there's so much certainty about what the future landscape would look like. So I think it's all well encouraging people to take risks, but I think at the end of the day, and this is true really in terms of the developments and what's going to happen so far as COVID is concerned, I think people need to have as much visibility of what the future landscape is going to look like as they can, and as much notice of that as they can in order for them to be able to prepare and to take the opportunity to prove themselves. Thank you very much, Paul. And so I'll switch to Alex. I know you're waiting, Joe. Um, I'll switch to Alex. So the IR35 question, as it was neatly swerved by Paul. No, very, very happy to deal with that. I'll be brief and I'll be dogmatic. IR35 is about taxation. A lot of people that have small limited companies are making a little bit of extra tax benefit by taking dividends rather than salaries, but there's not that much in it. I would mind betting that a lot of SMEs, perhaps earning 100,000 and below, are not benefiting that much from having companies and dividends. So pay the tax, earn some more, get on with it. I have no problem with IR35 attacking uh, people like journalists on half a million, putting it through a limited company. The key thing here is off payrolling rules, which have been deferred for another 12 months, need to be reviewed, they need to be looked at, because the key component of the way this country works is that small companies, entrepreneurs, nimble, flexible businessmen, need and women need to be encouraged. So don't think about the tax, think about the business first. Okay, and Jo, you've been waiting very patiently. Um, actually, um, this was um, in reference to, I can't remember who said about uh, entrepreneurs um, are still going to want to take risks and particularly in tech companies. So yesterday I ran a third event for university spin-out businesses. So these are businesses, um, well, basically everybody on the panel looked about 12 to me. Um, but these are young entrepreneurs with innovative, amazing ideas. And when I say they look about 12, they probably only are in their late 20s, early 30s. Absolutely no idea about running a business. A desperate for help. So popular was this event. Yes, it was totally oversubscribed. I've been booked to do another two of these. And what I was going to suggest, if there are people listening to this, who really fancy going and helping and mentoring and supporting these amazing young people 
get in touch with the university tech tram departments. They are desperate for people. And that could help you get your feet under the desk of an entrepreneur who is going to begin to rely on you and value you, and you really might enjoy it. Thank you very much, John. Um, from Louise Tester uh, to all panelists, a lot of the panel have been re referencing opportunities at the executive level. Does the panel think there are still opportunities for junior officers leaving who might not necessarily have the proven KSC key skills of senior officers? Um, I think absolutely. Um, the, the, the requirements for mid to senior management are, are, will be extensive, I believe, in six, six months' time. And I, I know of at least one company, which will remain na nameless, that will not actually employ anybody of the, above the rank of lieutenant commander because they're looking for the future managing directors. And that's the way I would look at this. If you're a junior officer leaving and you're embarking on a second, in some cases even third career, view it as an opportunity, opportunity to get up to the, up to the board level um, rather than expecting to, to enter at that level. So there are companies out there looking for young officers, but they're looking at you as their future. So that's the way I would um, approach that one. Any other panelists like to argue that point or agree? If you all agree, just nod. Uh, good, that's what I want to see. Okay, so we're coming to the end. Another, I'll, I'll ask another uh, two or three questions and then we'll start to close this down. Um, uh, from Craig Blackburn. Does the panel think that more businesses will look to hire in-house uh, managers, risk managers, or do they think this will be given to consultants? He says BC managers. I'm not sure what BC is. Could be business continuity managers. Is that a yes, Joe? You think they will? Um, business continuity, BC is definitely business continuity. And I think risk is going to be at the top of everybody's agenda now for a very long time. And um, particularly in the entrepreneurial sector that I work, there's a very, very slender understanding of managing it. As I, as I mentioned to you, of all the seven boards I sit on, and, and some of them are very substantial companies, um, one, one company went from 70 million to 6 million overnight in waste management. Um, so um, th there, are, there are going to be a much greater need for risk management, and they won't have those skills internally at the level they need it. Now, whether they'll want to bring people in permanently, I don't know, because I think there's going to be a resistance to full-time employment for a while. But I think consultancy opportunities will definitely be abound. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question um, about second movers, those who have lost, uh, have lost their jobs. Um, should they be looking to rejoin, to, to rejoin the military or join the reserves? What do you think, Sharon? I think this is dependable, actually. So, you know, the fact is there is a, there's an age limit on, re, on rejoining the reserves, for instance. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. Is it mid-50s? Uh, no, so, so thank you. Uh, so now is definitely a time to look at the reserve service. Um, uh, I mean, the, everything I was talking about in terms of reaching out to people, uh, that was regular and reserves, and uh, reservists that might look to want to do some full-time employment or indeed some of our uh, regular reservists or army reservists that want to have increased into activity. And of course, if you're leaving the regular service at the moment, it's a really good opportunity to um, transfer across for, um, for uh, continuing your contribution and service uh, with the reserves. Uh, in a similar sort of way to that we are trying to look at where we can relax some of the policy constraints that we have had in the past, we're doing exactly the same with rejoins. So um, if in doubt, I would say get in contact. Uh, I wouldn't constrain yourself too much by some of the age constraints. We can look at overage extensions. Of course, if the skill set is something that we would um, particularly value. Thank you very much, Sean. So um, I think I'm going to start closing this down now. It looks to me like people found it interesting and we, can, we might do this again. So thank you very much for attendees. If anybody has any questions they would like to send in, sorry, Sharon, please. So Lee, I, I have a telephone number, which is what I was trying to get. If, if somebody literally wanted to pick up the phone um, about a rejoin opportunity, either way. Yep. Thank you very much for attending everybody. Uh, full details will be published. And if we decide to do this again, we will let you know.